awesome. Again, thank you guys for being here this morning uh, as we continue on in our series to rediscover Christmas. I, I learned um, some really something really incredible um, a week or so ago. I thought it was really, really cool. Um, Christmas is kind of a really big deal uh, in Finland. You know, I don't know if you knew that or not. I don't know how much you know about Finland. Uh, but, but in Finland, Christmas is really a huge deal. In fact, they have a tradition as a country that started uh, back in the 1300s. So for over 700 years, uh, every year on Christmas Eve at noon, they have this tradition. And so I wanted to uh, share a little bit of this tradition to you. It's called the Declaration of Christmas Peace. And it's a few, it's a few, this video is a few minutes long, so don't panic. Uh, I realize it's a few minutes long. Um, so I want to introduce you to that and show you that.
huomenna, jos Jumala suo, on meidän Herramme ja vapahtajamme armorikas syntymäjuhla. Ja julistetaan siis täten yleinen joulurauha, kehoittamalla kaikkia tätä juhlaa asian kuuluvalla hartaudella viettämään, sekä muutoin hiljaisesti ja rauhallisesti käyttäytymään. Sillä se, joka tämän rauhan rikkoo ja joulujuhlaa jollakin laittomalla tai sopimattomalla käytöksellä häiritsee, on raskauttavien asianhaarain vallitessa syypää siihen rangaistukseen, jonka laki ja asetukset kustakin rikoksesta ja rikkomuksesta erikseen säätävät. Lopuksi toivotetaan kaupungin kaikille asukkaille riemullista joulujuhlaa. Imorgon, Vilgyr, Infallervor Herres, Och frälsares nåderikka födelsefest. Och var där förty här genom en allmän julfred, kunjord och påbjuden. Med åtvarning till en var, att denna högtid med tillbörligt andakt fira. Och i övrigt iaktaka ett stilla och fridsamt uppförande. Är medan den som här emot bryter samt julhögtiden genom något olagligt eller otillbörligt förfarande oskärar, gör sig under försvårande omständigheter, förfallen till det straff, lag och författningar för varje brott och överträdelse särskilt påbjuda. Slutligen tillönskas staden samtliga invånare en fröjdefull julhelig. I thought that that was beautiful. I mean, I thought it was great. Did y'all like that? What was your favorite part, Carla? Oh, okay. Yes, because that's the only part you knew. Exactly. All right, but listen to this. This this is called the Declaration of Christmas Peace, and it's done in the city of Turku. They joined in the city square. You saw all of the people there. They sing this Christmas at high noon. They sing this Christmas carol. The clock rings noon. And they read this declaration of Christmas peace. It's on the, it goes on the radios. It goes on all their TV channels. They stream it live on their internet now. And the whole country has this tradition on Christmas Eve at noon of listening to the declaration of Christmas peace. Now, so you won't be confused, let me read to you what it says in English. It says, tomorrow, God willing, is the graceful celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior. And thus is declared a peaceful Christmas time to all. By advising devotion and to behave otherwise quietly and peacefully. Because he who breaks this peace and violates the peace of Christmas by any illegal or improper behavior shall be under aggravating circumstances, be guilty, and punished accordingly to what the law and statutes prescribe for each and every offense separately. Finally, a joyous Christmas feast is wished to all inhabitants of the city. Isn't that awesome? I just thought that was a really cool tradition. And I thought it was really cool that the whole country uh, has built this tradition and focused on that. And how, if you break the law on Christmas, you will be dealt with. You know, you don't get no passes on Christmas uh, for the criminals. Um, but the reason I read that is because one of the greatest assets, one of the greatest parts of a person's life is peace. In fact, one of the greatest uh, stimulus or one of the greatest uh, igniters for an economy is peace. One, one of the best building blocks for a marriage is peace. One of the best ways to, to bring a child up is to bring them up in a home of peace. And so peace is this incredible uh, attribute to have in someone's life. It's great to be able to live a life 
of peace. But peace is not the absence of problems. And, and here's how I know how we think that. Because when I said that it's one of the greatest assets in a person's life is peace, all of us probably thought, oh, you're talking about somebody who has no problems, somebody who's got plenty of money in the bank, somebody who loves their job, they don't have COVID, uh, I mean, everything's great with them, their kids are perfect, their marriage is perfect, just everything is great. That's what most of us think when I said um, um, a peace in a person's life. When, when I said uh, it's a great economic asset, it's a great economic stimulus is peace, most of us thought about the last three years up until March when, when unemployment was going down and the stock prices were going up and people were getting hired and people were getting raises and people were buying houses and all of these kind of economic things were taking place. Peace. When I said it's one of the great building blocks of marriage, uh, I just go back to Ward and June Cleaver, that sort of who I grew up watching, and just how I never saw either one of them raise their voice to each other, ever. Like, even when they disagreed or whatever, it's like, well, Lord, honey, I just don't know if we should do that. Well, June, you know. And that was about the, 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 the tone of their voice to each other. And so we just think, when I say peace in a marriage, we just think about this marriage where everybody gets along and everything's great and there's never no problems or issues or disagreements. And when I talked about raising your children in a, in a home of peace, uh, I go to leave it to Beaver, man. I leave it to Beaver, man. Even when he did something wrong, he, he, he never got yelled at. I never saw Ward yank the belt off. I never saw them put him in time out. They just had a little talk with him. You know, Daddy, I had no idea that putting a turtle down the teacher's dress would be something bad to do. Well, Beave, next time you know, you not, need not do that. Okay, Dad. That's what we think of when we hear the word peace and we attribute it to something. We think it's something where there's no problems, there's no issues, there's no baggage, there's no struggles, there's no trials, there's no strife in life. But that is not what peace is. First week we talked about hope. Last week Dr. Doc, Dr. Dan talked about joy. Today we're going to talk about peace. And in Isaiah 9, there are some prophecies that are laid out for us. And I want you to realize before I read them that these prophecies were made 700 years before the birth of Christ. That's 300 years before the 400 years of silence that we talked about in week 1. So 700 years before the birth of this baby, on Christmas, Isaiah makes these prophecies about the Messiah that would come. In Isaiah chapter 9, uh, I'll just start reading in verse 1. It says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. I mean, that doesn't sound like peace to me. That sounds like chaos. That sounds like, uh, you know, he talked about the oppressor's rod, the burden of slavery, uh, the war and all, and the bloodstain and the bloodshed of war and all of that. That doesn't sound like peace. That doesn't sound like peace. That sounds like stress. That sounds like anxiety. That sounds like trouble. And that's the first point of today's message is when dealing with peace and trying to live a life of peace, we have to first identify the source of our stress. The source of our stress. Now, don't point to them right now. Don't point to them right now. But we need to identify the source of our stress. What is it in your life that gives you anxiety? What is it in your life that you're afraid of? What is it that, that you fear? What is it in your life that, that stresses you? You out, And for many people, life is full of challenges, you know, all the other days of the year, and Christmas doesn't alleviate those. In fact, Christmas exacerbates many of those. You may have financial stress, and you live paycheck to paycheck, and you're just happy for those weeks when you can put gas in your car and go to the grocery store, right? And, and, and so, so you have this financial stress, well, then Christmas comes along. 
and your kid wants uh, the, new, the new PlayStation 5 and, or the iPhone 12 and the certain clothes from a certain store, certain shoes that cost a certain price, and, 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 and that just adds to the financial stress in your life. It doesn't solve the financial stress in your life. How about family stress? You know, that crazy uncle, that crazy cousin. We got to go over to grandma's house on Christmas Eve and have dinner. And you're you're telling the people that are with you, look, one hour max. I cannot be around crazy Uncle Tony for for more than an hour or I'll go berserk. And, And so we all have those family stresses. And so Christmas doesn't alleviate it. Christmas actually exacerbates it and, and builds it up. What about the spiritual stress of the season? I mean, you want to have joy. You want to be able to sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. But you know in your heart that you don't live with joy. You want to love others. The Bible tells us to. You want to love others. But, but you know that that's a struggle. Maybe where you work or in your home. You want to have peace. But literally, fear rules your mind. Or maybe even, in fact, this year, you might would even say uh, that we have lived in fear for most of the year of this pandemic. And here's the thing. You know it's a spiritual struggle. You know it's a spiritual issue. It's not a physical issue. It's not a a manifestation issue. It's it's literally a spiritual struggle. And you you want to trust God in all of it. But then you know that most times you usually don't. When we identify our stress, we need to know that help is on the way. Verses 6 and 7 in Isaiah 9 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor, David, for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. There's four titles that are given there to this Messiah that is to come. And and this isn't the meat of the message, but I want to just cover those real quickly. First, he said he will be called Wonderful Counselor. I mean, this speaks to his wisdom. This speaks to his knowledge. One of the words that we use a lot of time is his omniscience, which means he's all-knowing. He knows everything. No surprise, he knew about COVID before it was manufactured in a lab, before it was sent out by some bat, before it got on some plane, before it landed here in the U.S., before it spread from California all the way across to us, he knew about it. He is all-knowing, and he knows about your stress. He knows about your finances. He knows about your family. He knows what's going on in your life, and he is called the Wonderful Counselor. The Bible tells us that his words are true and his answers are right. Sometimes we don't want to hear his words or hear his answers, but the scriptures tell us that his words are true and his answers are right. It says he will be called mighty God. That speaks to his strength and to his power. Another word that we use a lot of times is his omnipotence, his all-powerful. I've always had this, this mind when I talk about his omnipotence and his power of just this attitude of my daddy can beat up your daddy. I mean, my spiritual father can beat up the world's spiritual father. If it's a battle between God and Satan, I know that my dad can beat up their dad. It says he will be called an everlasting father. This speaks to an eternal relationship, one that's never ending, one that never ceases. He doesn't take time off. He doesn't take holidays off. He, 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 and he never says to you, I'm too busy to hear you right now. You know that moment... When you've been struggling for so long and you finally break and you come to God, he never says, whoa, 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 I ain't got time for that right now. But how many times do we say to him, I don't have time for you right now? He'll be called Everlasting Father. And then finally he said he'll be called the Prince of Peace. Well, if he's going to be the Prince of Peace, let me ask you a question. Who is the King of Peace? See, the Prince is always the son of the King. And so who is the King of Peace? God our Father. And this Messiah that was to come would be known as the Prince of Peace. You see, Jesus came to offer peace to the Jewish people. They lived in times, as Dr. Dan read, as I read the week before that, there was not peace in the earth. 
Man, they were in captivity. They were enslaved. They, they were being persecuted. They were being murdered even. They were being hindered in everything that they wanted to do. Even when they wanted to worship God, there were forces around them, uh, Rome and Greece and all of those that, that were oppressing them from doing that. And see, so many of us today understand the term of peace. And when we talk about the Prince of Peace, it isn't the absence of problems. In fact, that's point number two today. The peace of God is not the absence of problems. It is the presence of Christ in the midst of our problems. See, most of us in our minds, when we hear the word peace, we just think that there's no problems. But that's not what it means. In fact, it Peace is, is, is literally the presence of Christ in the midst of our problems. Now, peace is one of those words that if you go to 10 different people and ask them what it means, they'll each give you their take on that word peace. To me, the word peace, uh, has always I've always boiled it down to one word, and that's this word confidence. This confidence that Christ is with me in my struggles. That this confidence that God is with me in my financial stresses, this confidence that God is with me, he knows my hurt, he knows my pain, he knows my angst, he knows my fear. This, this idea that I have this confidence that God is with me as I walk through this life. Jesus wants to enable us. To be able to, to walk in the midst of problems with confidence instead of living in fear while we're in them. God, Jesus wants us to enable us to walk in the midst of problems with confidence uh, instead of reliving the hurt from our past over and over and over. There's many who, who can't move to the, to the future. They can't, they can't move to 2021 because they're still reliving 2020 in their hearts and in their minds and in their lives. And God wants us to be able to walk in confidence and know that he is with us instead of giving Satan a victory that Jesus has already won for us. Confidence. It isn't the absence of problems. It is the confidence that God is with us, that Jesus is with us. In the midst of the problems. I had this thought when I was working this up. Mary, Jesus' mother, had a very troublesome life. A lot of times we, we just sort of paint this picture of her as, man, everything must have been perfect for her. To, for her to be chosen for this and, and comply with God. and all of, I mean, it just, she just must have been perfect. But she had a very troublesome life. Let me explain. She was an unwed mother. Now, in today's society, in 2020 in the U.S., uh, that isn't shocking to us anymore. That, that happens quite frequently, actually. And, and, but in that day, you know that when, when she began to show, when she began to, to show as being pregnant and she wasn't married, you can bet that every time she walked down the street, every time she walked to the store, every time she went, that everybody in the city would cut their eyes at Mary. She wasn't married. What's she doing pregnant? She did something she wasn't supposed to be doing. And she lived with that reputation. Even when people who believed in what God was doing with her, I'm sure that as people gathered around and they said, no, this is the Christ child, this is the Messiah, an angel came and, and said, God is going to give you a child. And I'm sure when they explained all that, they're like, yeah, please, come on now. I ain't believing that. Look, we know what she did. It's evident what she has done. And she lived with that reputation. She became a mom at a very early age. Somewhere around 13, 14 years old, she became a mom. And when that baby came out, man, he had to eat. She had to change diapers. He cried. He slept. He grew. He cooed. He did all of those things that a baby did. And at 13 years old, she's now the mother of this child. Luke chapter 2 tells us that Mary knew that her son was part of a bigger plan down the road. Just imagine that, especially you moms. Just imagine that every time you look at that little baby and it coos to you and it smiles at you, you know, and you just love it and hold it. How about having in the back of your mind that, that down the road there's something for your son that will be horrific. She lived with that his whole entire life. She lived with that in the back of her mind. When he was 12, he got lost in a big crowd. 
Have you ever experienced that? We did one time with Austin. We were at a mall at a, one of the big arcades, and we were having a birthday party. And um, so kids are just running around everywhere. You know, it's like a madhouse, and they're playing games. And it comes time to leave, and, and we're getting everybody together. And so obviously we have Blake, and then we're trying to find Austin. We can't find Austin. And Monica starts to, I mean, she amps it up on the freakout level. I mean, she's like, Austin, where's Austin? Where's Austin? And so we're scattering through the whole arcade. We're looking for Austin. We even go outside the arcade into the mall. We're starting to live. And once we get outside of the arcade and we don't see Austin, Monica's really amped up to 20 on the, on the freakout level. And, I mean, we, our hearts are racing. I don't know if you moms have ever felt that when you've lost your kid for a while. Our hearts were racing. We're scared to death. What could have happened? And he was in the arcade the whole time sitting in some car game that we just couldn't see. But you know how your adrenaline gets going. And and so that happened to Mary. Her her child got lost in a crowd of people. Where could he be? Oh, my goodness. Where's he at? We can't find him. He was in the temple teaching. She was as close as she could be to his trial She was as close to him as she could be the whole step of the way when he was beaten, when he was crucified. It says she was at the foot of the cross. She was as close as she could be when she watched her son die. Now, let me just ask you, how many of you moms want to sign up for that life? Right? It wasn't that Mary didn't have any troubles. Mary didn't have any problems, any issues. But... She had confidence that God was with her because what happened? She got to see her son live again. She saw him out of the grave, not just get put in the grave. And that's the the final point today is that peace defies our struggles. Peace defies our struggles. When you're in the midst of problems, when you're in the midst of troubles, when you're in the midst of chaos, Peace of God literally defies the struggles in your life. Philippians chapter 4 says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. You see, what I know is that most of us want what verse 7 says, but we want it without having to do what verse 6 tells us to do. We want verse 7. We want his peace. We want him to guard our hearts and minds, but, but we don't pray about anything. We don't pray about everything. We don't tell God what we need. We don't thank him for the things he's already done for us. And we know where it says there in verse 7 that his peace will guard our hearts and minds. We know why that's so critical because Proverbs 4.23 tells us to guard your heart above all else. Because it determines the course of your life. If I put those two verses together, his peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And it will determine the course of your life. See, peace is not the absence of problems. Peace is the confidence that Christ is in the midst with you. And our peace can truly only be found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. 700 years before his birth, Isaiah declared him as the prince of peace. And 33 years later after his birth, in John 16, he says, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And then Paul said all throughout the New Testament, many times over and over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, He is our peace. Peace always has, continues to be, really the greatest thing you desire in your life, and it's found only in Jesus Christ. It's not found in a job. It's not found in a relationship. It's not found in a a status. It's not found in a a new car or a new home. It, It isn't found in any of those things. It's found only in Jesus Christ. I had finished my sermon up and already finalized it and everything. And I had this thought. 
So I just sort of wrote it, scratched it down on paper. It's bad when you can't read your own handwriting sometimes. So, but, um, but it was just thought that there's really two kinds of peace. There's earthly peace and eternal peace. And in John 16, when Jesus said, uh, in this world you will have many troubles, what he's essentially saying is, there's not going to be much earthly peace. But then the second half of that verse, he says, I tell you this because I have overcome the world. What he's telling you is, there's not going to be much earthly peace, but there's going to be an eternal peace. And what is sad is when you see people trading the eternal peace for the earthly peace. When you see people trading the things that, yes, they can't see, but, and that await them in the future for things that they can touch now and have now and, and, and utilize now. And so many people trade their eternal peace for this earthly peace. I was reading a magazine article, periodical I get, and here was the title of the article. I want you to hear this. 2020 was a great year. Don't you want to know what I was reading? 2020 was a great, let me give you the rest of the title, maybe this will help. 2020 was a great year for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Amidst a worldwide pandemic, amidst a political chaos, amidst uncertainty of vaccines and masks and vaccinations and shutdowns, and amidst all of that, this magazine said 2020 was a great year for the advancement of the kingdom of God. You want to know what that magazine was? Voice of the Martyrs. You know why Voice of the Martyrs can write a headline like that and an article like that? Because every month when we get there, when I get their little magazine, uh, it has eight to ten articles. Every single article in the magazine is about people who live in places where re, you know religion is oppressed, where literally to meet like this, you would you would be arrested, imprisoned, maybe even killed. And every article is about someone who lives in the Sudan or someone who lives in Iraq or someone who lives in these countries where, where they don't have religious freedom and, and people go. Or sometimes they have to smuggle. I was reading part of the article of this magazine, smuggling Bibles uh, into countries to get the word of God in there. And so every article in that magazine is about people who are given their lives Day in and day out for the furtherance of the gospel of God in places It's not supposed to go. The difference, earthly perspective, eternal perspective. I can guarantee you those people in those countries that are highlighted in the Voice of the Martyr magazines, quite honestly, are not worried about what's under the Christmas tree. Eternal perspective, earthly perspective. Eternal peace, earthly peace. The question is, what is our confidence in? Is our confidence in the Prince of Peace that even when we go through struggles in this earth, in this life, that in the midst of our troubles, he is with us. And we can live a life that acknowledges that, that draws on that, 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 that in the midst of our struggles, that's what we're clinging to. We're not clinging to an answer that we can figure out, an answer we can come up with. We're not, we're not, we're not trying to work it out for God. We're letting God work it out for us. Now, when we can live that kind of life, we will experience true, eternal peace. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for peace. Lord, just the reality that in this world we will have troubles, and we do, Father. This, this year, maybe more than many others. But, Father, peace is never about the absence of problems. It's about the confidence that you are in the midst of them with us. It's not a question of what can I do or what can I not do. It's, it's the question of, uh, of who is with me in the midst of my troubles or my sorrows or my baggage or my, my problems, my issues, my stress. 
my panic, my fear, my anxiety. Who is with me in the middle of all that? Father, I know that the Christmas season does not alleviate many people's problems. In fact, it just piles on to many of the issues that we deal with day in and day out throughout the year. But Father, I pray that we would open our hearts to the Prince of Peace. To the one who says, I have overcome the world. To the one who says, I loved you enough that I came to this earth, that I died on the cross for your sins, for your eternity. For you to have peace in me. Father, in this world we will have troubles, but you have overcome the world. And we praise you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to stand and tucker them. We're going to lead us in a song. And, and, and as they do, I just encourage you to open your heart to that reality. That eternal peace that only Jesus can bring to you. It wouldn't solve all the earthly problems that we have to deal with and walk through. But the confidence that he is with us will change our perspective on any struggle that we're in. Let's stand. Tucker. Tucker.